October 1967. The headline told of a blockbuster spy revelation. That spy was Kim Philby, exposed as part of a British ring spying for the Soviet Union. He came from within British intelligence. After years of suspicion and denials, Philby's identity was only revealed when the Sunday Times and editor Harold Evans broke one of the biggest stories of the 20th century. Then there was thalidomide, a drug approved by the government, given to pregnant women to treat morning sickness. But it caused horrible deformities in babies. Evans used the paper to lead a crusade, forcing the government to compensate heartbroken mothers. It was those kind of stories that led the Queen to later knight Evans for his service to journalism. But his storied career wasn't all accolades. In 1981, Rupert Murdoch bought the Times of London with Evans as editor. The two were soon on a collision course. The differences between me and Mr. Murdoch should not be prolonged. I am therefore resigning tonight as the editor of the Times. Evans left the famous newspaper he had built up over 14 years. The last thing in the world Rupert Murdoch wants is an editor who doesn't take orders. Aye, aye, sir. He's an aye, aye, sir, man. Evans moved to America and reinvented himself, heading up the Atlantic Monthly, founding Condé Nast Traveler, and becoming president of Random House, overseeing memoirs by Colin Powell, Marlon Brando, and in 1995, a young author named Barack Obama. That's before writing his own books. And Evans was not alone as a journalism luminary. His wife, Tina Brown, has been just as much a star in her field. She turned the 300-year-old British magazine Tatler into a hot commodity, quadrupling its circulation. In the U.S., she shed Vanity Fair's state image with celebrity covers like this one, showing actress Demi Moore very pregnant but not very dressed. And then brought some dazzle to the very literary New Yorker. Her changes were controversial, but she boosted numbers. In 1999, a brand new venture, Talk Magazine. Its launch party of A-listers showed the kind of splash Brown hoped to make. Very eclectic, but at the same time driven by a point of view and a smart take and fresh voices and intimate access. By 2002, the magazine folded. But her newest venture, the online Daily Beast, is a thought leader in journalism, showing that Brown, like her husband, has had a knack for reinventing herself and her industry. As websites like hers gain viewers, newspapers and magazines where Brown and Evans made their fame are struggling just to survive. But in journalism, Harry Evans and Tina Brown still take starring roles together. Mary Snow, CNN, New York. So joining me now are Sir Harold Evans, who chronicles his life and career in his new book, My Paper Chase, and Tina Brown, who, as you just heard, is the founder and editor of The Daily Beast. Welcome to you both, and I think we should note that this is the first time you've agreed to appear together, and we're very grateful, we're yes. very happy to explore some of this. Beauty and the Beast. Well, there you go. <laughs> we said old and new, but we didn't mean that chronologically. We meant in the media I landscape. <laughs> You know, I want to ask you, Harry, I was watching you watch that report, and when you came up resigning during the tenure of Rupert Murdoch at the Times, you looked quite wistful. Take us back to that moment. What did it mean to you personally and professionally? Well, it was a setback, no doubt. Uh, maybe I made some mistakes, uh, but I don't uh, want to dwell on it too much because it was a very adventurous time. Nobody has ever edited both the Sunday Times and the Times. So I was very glad to edit the Times even for a year before the guillotine came down. I was wistful because it meant I was going to say goodbye to a lot of wonderful colleagues and people. Uh, but I had no idea that I was going to have what Scott Fitzgerald said was impossible, a second act in America. So I have no regrets looking back. I mean, the United States gave me an embrace, embrace yeah. and, and uh, I've put down roots here. You'd have a job to pick me up again now. <laughs> and embraced Tina as well. Well, me metaphorically. I'll say, I'll, say, <laughs> yeah, I'll say it's just been one success after the other, except for talk. Well, I have had the most amazing time in America, you know, and actually what was exciting for us both was to come here together, sort of in a strange way, in equal terms, because in England, of course, Harry was the huge superstar in English journalism. When we came to America, we both came as sort of new, new immigrants, really, and uh, we've had this adventure together, and it's been the most remarkably, fabulously, you know, exciting time. What is different for you being a journalist in America rather than back in Britain? 
I think that the, in England and Britain, uh, you do always feel the boundaries. You know, I mean, in America, there's this wonderful sense of a free place to conquer in terms of audiences that are ever growing. Uh, there is a sense of, of freedom of reporting. I mean, in, not until I worked in America did I understand how tight the legal laws are in England and how constrained you are and how the, this whole atmosphere of sort of class and and uh, just the and establishment the law, and, the and the law, law, and the law are in terms actually, of libel. are actually, you know, just something that British journalists accept. And I hadn't felt in prison about it when I was there, but working here, it's a very different phenomenon, which I think you feel too. I, it is. When I joined the Sunday Times as editor, I mean, I joined it earlier, and put out my hands in an exclamation, this should not happen. I found there was a wall here and a wall here. And it was a legal wall saying, you cannot say this. You cannot expose the threat of my children. You cannot campaign for the threat of my children. You cannot investigate. So how did you do it? Well, a certain With amount of- With all those pushback. Well, first you of all- You broke down the walls. I mean- I broke down the walls. How did I break down the walls? First of all, I had a very rare thing, a lawyer, who believed in publishing the truth. You'll miss truth in the CNN ads. Okay, so you'll appreciate that. And he showed me how I might challenge the law in a construct, not just by saying, oh, oh I'm gonna defy the law. There's nothing, I believe in the rule of law. So we had to do things as legally as we could, but challenge. And he gave me the idea. And secondly, the support of a proprietor, Roy Thompson, who totally believed in investigative journalism, who totally believed in challenging authority. In fact, when I took the job, the Let chairman said to me, you'll be totally free so long as you don't criticize the queen. I said, I said so it's okay to criticize her government? Yes, go ahead. So you, uh, thalidomide had an effect. Breaking of that story meant that that drug was no longer given to well, women. The, the greatest effect, we got compensation for the, for the children which was being denied them. And secondly, the British government, when I won the case in Europe, had to change the law affecting contempt of court, which said that as soon as a case is before the courts, nobody can comment. That doesn't apply in the United States. And what about the effect on investigative journalism in today's world, not just in the new media world, the digital world that you're in now and pioneering, but also in the world where you see resources slashed and certainly not enough rain given to investigation? Well, I'm sure Tina will agree with this. We both constantly talk about this. And the fact is that as soon as you stop investigating, cover that means finding things out which somebody wants to conceal you are going to face disasters. Now, do you want some examples? The financial meltdown, not discovered, not detected, not reported in the newspapers. The war in Iraq. The re real reasons for going into Iraq, not investigated, not covered. Katrina, to a lesser extent. So we, uh, maybe Afghanistan, which you know a lot about. So we're actually living a life of what it's like to be without the press. So Tina, can the digital media actually take the place of traditional media and all its resources and all its time and all its original reporting. Well, let me first of all say is I think there is a bad rap in a sense that digital media has ruined, as it were, journalism for the mainstream media. I would say the mainstream media, so-called, has been ruined by the greed of managements. Because actually the greed of managements is what has disemboweled newspapers and frankly killed off investigative reporting long before uh, the digital world. I mean, but in now the end, that we're in the digital world, and you're absolutely right about the resources and the profit motive, what can your media do to fill in if we're not going to have traditional investigative reporting, which is so vital in so local vital. and national? Let me say this. She did a marvelous piece on the beast, which showed, which no newspaper did, an investigative piece of how members of Congress were bribed by Fanny and Freddie, the housing behemoths who led us into this terrible crisis. 126 models. And on the website, the Daily Beast, they showed which, which congressman got what, how much money. But do you think it can have the same effect, Tina, when you look well, down I the do, line? You see, I actually do think it can. I think, unfortunately, we're in this very scary transition right now from one kind of media climate to another. It's kind of like the Industrial Revolution applied to media. So there's a kind of scary 
sort of uh, hiatus right now when the money isn't seem to be in either place. I actually think that we will be able to protect investigative journalism. I think financial models will be found to make websites profitable enough, which will simply mean allocating resources. And actually, I think there's so much uh, journalistic excitement amongst the young now, so much desire, in fact, to cover stuff, and so much ease of starting up things that I actually do think, ultimately, investigative journalism can prosper. So it's interesting to hear you speak like this about investigative journalism, because you're known more for the glossy, for the highbrow lowbrow which you sort of brought into the the journalism lexicon whether it was at Vanity Fair, New Yorker, uh, Tatler etc. I, I sense you being a little harder in your focus. No, no, Is that no, right, no. Tina? Well, well, you know, let me say this in her defense. I'm no, that wasn't the no, when, when, she, right. when she investigated, when you investigated, when you investigated how Princess of Wales phones were tapped Everybody else had passed it by. You said, who tapped her phones? Were they tapped? Was it paranoid? And you investigated that right in your book about the Princess well, I did, of but Wales. that, of course, took me many months to investigate, to, to, to Christiane's point. I mean, the kind of stuff... I think what makes people very excited when they read uh, my paper chase Harry's book is that they do have a feeling of a world in which the money was there to support a journalistic ethos which does feel like it's evaporated. I mean, the kind of stuff that you did at the Sunday Times, it took time, it took passion, it took a big staff. I mean, you know, your investigations well, had, had a staff a of... a big staff. Just hang on a second. Well, how many people well, were well, on your look, investigative team? I had 135 teams? journalists on the Sunday Times when the New York Times had more than a thousand. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Washington Post had more than a thousand. We didn't have a large staff. Where did you get that idea? <laughs> I mean, no, but seriously, where did you speaking, get that idea? I mean, seven people, you know, <laughs> investigating yeah. thalidomide and collating yes, materials. Yes, so yes. what did you have? If it wasn't a huge staff, what made the difference? That we don't have today. Well, first of all, uh, I, I only appointed geniuses. They had to come <laughs> in with an IQ. No, seriously, they had to come. Up. We had a very disparate staff. We had antique dealers. We had former embezzlers, former military people. We had former spies. We had every every former you could think of. So we had a variety of talent. Very important. They didn't come out of a homogeneous background. You know, know Harry's, Harry's anti-journalism school, and that's. It. Well, I was in that sense, not in other senses. Uh, we had that. We had the back, the confidence mm -hmm. that if we did expose something the proprietor and the chairman would stick up for us and not wilt at the first complaint from an advertiser. And we will pick this up right after a break. More with Harry Evans and Tina Brown when we return.